Your homework from last time was to look at those sections from the Gospel according to John. So we're going to start on that back side today and, and see, see what you discover or, or found. And maybe before we do that, like just review a little bit of some of the some of the big themes that came out of Genesis one and two. We'll do a review on that because that's really been the, the whole goal of of doing this this uh, class together is to give you the skills that when you're reading other sections of the Bible, you can link them back to some of the the themes that are already there in Genesis 1 and 2, because really all that the, the biblical authors are doing uh, through inspiration are tracing those themes over and over, presenting them in different ways. So if you can grab onto them from Genesis 1 and 2, then it's, it's going to give you some really, really helpful skills to read the Bible. So let's just review first some of the big themes that came out of Genesis 1 and 2 and see what we remember from that. I don't have my the board because Mrs. Abling's Mrs. Abling's uh, pictures and, and things are on there. What did we learn about the, the spirit of God from Genesis 1? See if I can give some little. You separated the darkness from the light, or the heavens from the earth. Okay, so uh, maybe, yeah. So in, in creation, they did talk about how God made an expanse between the waters above and the waters below. But the waters are definitely a place where we see the spirit of God early on. Okay, so we. The Spirit of God is presented in Genesis 1, verse 2 as, as hovering over the waters and the unformed creation. So almost like the, the, the Holy Spirit is there to, to bring order out of chaos and to bring life and light and all of the things that are going to take place. Okay, so that's the first theme. It's a very big one. The Spirit of God hovering over the waters to bring life and order. Um, the, the earth, as it's described in Genesis 1, the earth simply is referring to? Yeah, humans. Okay, humans come from the earth, but? Yes. Ben? Dry land. The, okay, the dry land. That's what the earth is. It's, it's not described as a globe or anything like that. It's, it's just simply described as dry land upon which humans have a foundation to, to live and to cultivate. The heavens, how about the heavens? How are those described in Genesis 1? God controls the heavens. He lives in them. Kind of figuratively speaking, he lives in the heavens. Okay, so the so heavens, are, heavens are God's space, God's Dominion, good. His his throne room, so to speak. But what else? What else in Genesis one is? Uh, uh, how are the heavens described? Stars. Okay. The heavens are stars, uh, sun, moon, heavenly bodies. We would say. Which, if you were in, if you were in the first service or or coming to the second service, when Peter quotes from the prophet Joel. He talks about the heavenly bodies and the heavens and them actually being turned, turned to blood. The sun, the moon, and the stars. What else? Anything else about the heavens and the way they're described in Genesis 1? God's throne room. There are heavenly bodies in them. And do you remember what those heavenly bodies are also representative of in the minds of an ancient person? God. Okay. Lowercase g gods, or, or maybe we'd say divine beings. Sometimes, you, I suppose you'd even picture them as, as cherubim, 
guardians to the realm of God was the way ancients would have seen the heavenly bodies. And it would have even led some people in other cultures to actually worship them as gods. Good. Okay, so earth is dry ground. It's there for humans to have a foundation and cultivate and take care of. Heavens are the realm that's above. God's throne room. There are heavenly bodies in them. There's even water above. Sort of like we talked we talked about that and the Psalms talk a lot about this this water that's above the expanse. So okay. That means water is sometimes represented as as dangerous in the mind of an ancient person. The seas are dangerous, chaotic. There might be some pretty strange big creatures lurking underneath. <laughs> So all sorts of that stuff. Okay, so we've got heaven, earth, we've got the Spirit of God. Let's move on to Genesis 2, some of the themes that we saw there. What comes into being that's very uh, significant and important on the dry land? Genesis 2. He, um, cre he created the um, animals and also, and also the crops, so, um, so mankind could um, uh, survive. Okay, I was thinking specifically of, of trees. Yeah. Trees. trees, and it says that before there were any trees, that there, there needed to be water, so there's this stream we learned about in Genesis 2 that, that uh, brings water, and then trees are able to flourish. And God puts all sorts of trees around. <laughs> trees that are good for food, trees that are actually good, pleasing to the eye. And then he also puts in the garden the tree of life. So that's a huge theme throughout the Bible. Just remember, we saw that in Isaiah 11. The tree of life, and then the tree of, of the knowing of good. How about the theme of, of uh, humanity and what they are created to be and to do? They're in God's image. Okay, they're in the image of God. That's a very, very important theme that's going to be traced throughout the Bible. The image of God. And then, do you remember how, um, who are they reflected by later on in the biblical narrative? Individuals who are working in the temple presence of God. Priests. So the humans are, um, later on when the priests are serving in the temple, they're actually a reflection of what the humans were supposed to be in God's temple presence in the garden. They're priests to work it and to take care of it and to pr proclaim the goodness of God. Right, so we've got... The role of humans, we've got uh, the tree of life, then the garden itself. This would have been sort of like a higher elevation where God's presence was, was there and heaven and earth overlap at the Garden of Eden. Let's, um, let's go through, I think we've covered a lot of the different themes we've seen in Genesis 1 and 2, and we're probably missing some. But I, I do want to get through some stuff today. So if you did have a chance to look at these sections from the gospel according to John, maybe let me ask first, who, who did have a chance to do that? Okay. We'll let you guys kind of lead us through that. And then everybody else, if you want to look up those references along the way with us um, or if you all could just explain, but we're going to take some of these themes that we just talked about from Genesis 1 and 2, and how is uh, John connecting some of those themes from, from the beginning of the Bible to his account of Jesus? John 1, 29 to 32, what did you find there as you were working through it? Bob, go ahead. John testified that uh, Jesus is the Son of God, and he's the reason she made life. Okay, so you saw the tree of life theme there. Okay. 
Jess? He saw the spirit um, come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. Yeah. Okay, good. John testifies that he saw the spirit come down from heaven and remain on Jesus. And where are they? Coincidentally, when that happens, they're in the water. They're in the water. And the Spirit of God is, is hovering over the waters where Jesus is baptized. And again, if we're, if we're connecting that back to Genesis 1, the Spirit's hovering to bring creation. It's almost like John is saying, here comes the new creation through this chosen one of God. Okay, John 2, 18 to 22. Which one of the themes, maybe of Spirit of God, Temple, Tree of Life, Image of God? John 2, 18 to 22. Which one is John picking up here? Madeline? Temple. Temple, yes. So this would be where Jesus is driving out the money changers and the people who are uh, using the temple for, for inappropriate reasons. And they ask him, hey, hey, you, who do you think you are? By what authority are you doing all of these things? And Jesus uh, tells them, destroy this temple, and I'll rebuild it in three days. So John's picking up on this theme of Jesus as the dwelling of God. Heaven on earth, overlapping in the presence of Okay, John 4, this is the account of Jesus telling his disciples as they're making their way up to, to Galilee, I think. He's like, well, we're going to do something that, that Jewish people don't normally do. And we're going to pass through Samaria. We're not going to go around it. We're going to go right through it because I have to do that, actually. What, uh, what were some of the, the themes that you saw here? In Jesus was in interested in um, solely in geography. He was interested in, um, in Samaria because um, especially that um, especially he, he told the woman that the gift of God is the, the Lord's table represents the uh, living water. Okay, so we've got a, a water theme. Do you remember what was coming out of Eden in Genesis chapter 2? There was a river that was coming out of Eden, and it separated into four headwaters, which were all going out to what would later become known as, as um, Israel's maybe biggest enemies. It was separating into Babylon and Kush, <coughs> Assyria. And this was to show that even, even in, in Genesis 2 already, God wants to bring Eden blessings out to the whole world. So here you have Jesus going to a place that would have been considered like forbidden territory at the time, Samaria, and he's bringing water, he tells this one. Right? If you knew the gift of God, you would have asked me for a drink of water, and I would have given it to you. So... There's this theme of, of Jesus as this river of life going out into the world to bring to bring Eden blessings. All right, Genesis or John six fifty three to fifty seven. This is um, after Jesus feeds five thousand with with bread and fish, and then he starts talking about how he is the bread that came down from heaven. But there's maybe even another theme that we could could pick up from Genesis 1 based on these verses. Didn't he, in this verse, if I'm right, didn't he come as the son of man in the flesh? Yeah, that, yep, that's what he's saying. And then, um, to pay, um, to pay for our sins, and he had to relate to us, and that's, um, that's why he became um, he, he came in the flesh, so he could he could relate to us and then die for our sins. Okay, those are all yeah, absolutely. Those are very true uh, teachings from Scripture. 
maybe if we're going to try and connect it back to one of the one of the themes that we've seen in Genesis one and two, Jesus is is, is telling people to do do what with him in this section. Eat and drink. Yeah. Eat and drink. Can you guys think of a, a tree, maybe, that was in Genesis 2 that was that would give you God's life if you ate of it? The tree of life. Okay? And so Jesus is saying, my flesh is real food, my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them, just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father. So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. So... Think of a tree of life. Eternal life. Yeah, a tree of life kind of idea, consuming God's own life given to us in Jesus. We could, there's lots of other places in John that we could follow these things, but let's just jump ahead to John 19. What did what did God do when He finished His work of creating? He rested. Yeah. And then break His legs. I don't understand it. It's all about that. That's more connected to the Passover and the way that uh, God told the individuals. We're celebrating Passover not to not to break the legs of, of the uh, lamb that they were roasting, and so that's connect. John's connecting that more to Passover that the lambs of or the legs of Christ were not were not broken because he's the true Passover lamb. Well, there was a very short description um, when the soldier pierced the song. Um, those extremities of song, um, hands and his feet. Blood and water will come. <coughs> and the water is so uh, descriptive, symbolic to, uh, to the flowing water of light. Great. Yes, that, that would definitely be a connection back to Genesis 2 in this river that's going out from Eden into the world. And there Jesus is on, on God's holy mountain, where he's crucified, Jerusalem. And water is flowing out of his side to be the water of life, this river of life that's flowing out to the world. Yeah, because even, uh, I, I, I think, individuals have, people who actually know things about the human body and death and, you know, that scientifically there's not really a, a, a reason why water would have come out of someone's side who was was dead. So this is an image that John is picking up from, from Genesis 2 of the water, the river of the water of life. But I think the one I most want to bring your attention is what Bob, Bob talked about. Because in Genesis 2, verse 2, it says, By the seventh day God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day he rested from all of his work. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all of the work of creating he had done. Jesus is crucified on a Friday. And, you know, John and all the other evangelists make it very clear that people want to get ready for the Sabbath, which is the next day. That the day of preparation is happening. So they want to get Jesus' body down quickly so they can celebrate the Sabbath. Well, the seventh day... <laughs> is when Jesus goes to rest. He goes to rest in the tomb. Um, and it's finished, he says, from the cross. He was done with all of his work. And you can think of it as him bringing a new creation. He had completed his, the work that he was given to do, and now he's going to rest in the tomb until the third day. So I think that's definitely a connection back to Genesis 1. And then, and then we'll talk about John 20 and 
and he stuff. He fulfilled all the scriptures, so what was talked about him in the beginning of the Bible, he did. Mm -hmm. Now, what they were saying was the truth, and he, he finished that job. Right. Which includes the forgiveness of sins, but it also includes uh, the undoing of death. <coughs> um, everything that, I mean, everything we read in, in Isaiah 11 last week, and it includes Jesus bringing a, a new creation and his kingdom coming, and I just like to include all of that is tied in. And so he rested from the work that he had <laughs> he had completed. It is finished. All right. But, and, yeah. Let's start. Any any questions or comments or thoughts about it? Friday is the seventh day or Saturday. Saturday is the seventh day. So in right in a in a Jewish week, Friday night as soon as sunset happens, you have your your Shabbat meal. On Friday night, because the start of the day is always at sunset the day before. Good. So I don't think that's a coincidence that Jesus went to rest in the tomb on the Sabbath. I think that's fulfilled the scriptures. Any other questions or comments about reading the Bible this way and? It's very clear that, that John, again, who's, who's inspired by the Holy Spirit, was also an individual who was immersed in the Hebrew Bible. And who, you know, for whom Genesis 1 and 2, these, are, these kinds of things are just a part of your fabric as a, as a person who's meditating on the scripture. So, not at all trying to discount that the Holy Spirit wasn't involved in the way the Gospel according to John is, is composed, but it's the literary way that it's designed is, there's some thought going into this. These aren't just people sitting down and <laughs> then Jesus did this this day, and then he did this the next day. It's very intentional. Yeah. It's a lot of meaning to me. I've never yeah. associated in this job. And, and that's why we spent a lot of time on Genesis 1 and 2, the first two lessons. We, we tried to spend a lot of time to see what, what's God actually saying in those parts of the Bible. Because if, if you can, if you, can you know, capture that, I think you're going to be able to read, read these other things into the rest of the scripture. Okay, we're going to use John 20 as uh, the part for our lesson today. And so let's get out the sheet that says the new heaven and earth and the new creation. And we have just like a special gift today too because with Pentecost, I mean, I, there's just a lot of overlap between what's happening in Pentecost and the stuff we'll be looking at today. Okay, so John 20, verses 19 to 23. Let's read this out loud. And we're going to, to trace again the, the themes from Genesis 1 and 2. Does anybody want to volunteer to read these verses, 19 to 23? Bob, go ahead. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked to spare the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If they're not forgiven, they are not forgiven. Okay. Thanks, Bob. So which theme would you say is, is John picking up and running with here? The breath of life. The breath of life, the Spirit of God, right? Okay. Jesus is, uh, it's, it's the evening of, of his resurrection day. The apostles are locked in a dark room. <laughs> Remember the darkness at the, in Genesis 1, where the Spirit of God came and hovered over? They're locked in a dark room. They're afraid. 
Uh, they wonder if, if life's worth living anymore. And Jesus appears, resurrected, shows them the nail marks in his hands and his side, and then breathes on them. Receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, so what's the Holy Spirit here to do? If we're going to follow the Spirit's work as it's shown in Genesis 1. He's here to, to guide us. Okay. To comfort us and to show us how to go. Okay, good. Good. So uh, Jesus uses that language earlier in John. I'm going to send you the, the advocate, the comforter. Ben? Giving us peace through forgiveness. Okay, peace. Bringing, bringing the gift of peace to human beings whose whose hearts and lives are unsettled by all sorts of chaotic darkness. Sometimes self-inflicted, sometimes just things that are happening to us and around us, coming to bring peace. Can you explain in verse 23 what the Phoenix says? Sure. Verse 23. Uh, so not only is the peace intended for for them individually. Pastor Butler will talk about this in, in the message today. But what else is, is the Spirit going to compel the apostles to go and do? Preach the gospel all the world. Okay. okay. Show God's love to them and give them the message of the gospel. Okay, they're going to go and take this message out into the world. We have right to not forgive people. I don't quite get that question. Good. Good. Let's do a little catechism work, huh? That's not off the table this morning. Which of the six parts of the catechism do we see in, the, in Jesus' words, if you forgive anyone's sins, they're forgiven. But if you do not forgive them, they're not forgiven. The ministry of the keys and confession. Yeah. Yeah, so yes, we do have the right not to forgive someone their sins. Uh, Martin Luther says to to uh, forgive the sins of penitent sinners, but to withhold forgiveness from the impenitent as long as they do not repent. All of that authority and power is coming through the Spirit Jesus breathes on the apostles. Comments, thoughts. So the overlapping of heaven and earth in this section is coming in what we call the, the spirit, but who's the spirit coming upon? The church, exactly. The church is the place where Jesus is given the keys. And that's, you could say that's the overlapping of heaven and earth to the church. Okay, Madeline, you looked like you had a, a thought or a question before. I think I kind of... What we say, he is creating a new life. Yes, absolutely. I think, I think that's all over. It's, and that's, that's, connecting, that's connecting the Spirit's work at, at creation to Madeline. He's there to create new life. And, and so that's what's happening here in this... In this dark room of sorrow and <laughs> sadness and um, despair, I guess, even. It'd be hard not to find despair in this section of, you know, grown men who are locking themselves in a room and, like, what's the point? I mean, he's dead. He's, our leader's dead. What's the point of even living? Okay. So that's... That's the way the gospel according to John basically ends. All these things are written so that you may believe that, that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And that by believing you may have life in his name. Let's go to Ephesians 2. And, uh, you know, reading the Bible in context is always <laughs> to be preferred over just like picking and choosing little pieces, but maybe if you were here for the Ephesians class that we did, you, you kind of remember the significance of this section of scripture. This is a very important section of Paul's letter to the Ephesians. 
Or would somebody read verses 19? Jeff, you want to take the 19? Some who are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. Built on the law. The foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as a chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a drawing in which God lives by the Spirit. Thank you, Jeff. All right, so which which themes from, from Genesis 1 and 2 are we seeing here? Spirit of God. Okay, here again we have a reference to the Spirit of God. The Holy Temple. Yeah, and then there's, I think, this idea of a temple, which is a, a, a dwelling place of the Lord. The Garden of Eden was supposed, that was... So, basically a temple of God, a tabernacle of God where he was dwelling and where heaven and earth were united together by his presence among the people. And now it's saying what is what is the temple of God the dwelling in which he lives? Us. Okay, okay. Specifically, <coughs> those who are built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets and who trust in Jesus as, as their uh, rescuer. And it's their hope. Now this is pretty significant because if, if we're talking about places where heaven and earth overlap, um, that means the assembled people of God is his dwelling place. The place where heaven and earth are overlapping. Uh, not because of anything about us, <laughs> but uh, because of what God's doing there and because of the way his, he's pouring his spirit out. That's pretty significant for us to think about and our purpose. Thoughts or comments about that? I, I have a question. Yeah. When we, um, the temple, the temple he's talking about, mm -hmm. um, aren't we the temples of, the, of God in, in a sense? Because the, the, the um, we are to live in a living sacrifice. Um, we're to be sanctified. We're to be um, an example of the Holy Spirit um, to other to non-Christians and Christians. Yeah, yeah, and, and I would even just say we, we will be. You know, um, maybe the thing that uh, we do talk about a, a lot about that. Like individually, we're each a, a temple of the Lord, and I think that's a it's a very biblical way to talk about ourselves as individuals. But I don't know that we always do the best job of talking about us communally as a temple of the Lord, and that's what Pentecost is all about. I mean, the, the fiery presence of God. If you remember the tab in the tabernacle, the fire coming down and the cloud filling the tabernacle to show that God was dwelling among His people. That's what Pentecost is. I mean, it's the fiery presence of the Lord coming and filling his, his people as a community so that they would bring Eden blessings to the world. It applies to us individually, but definitely communally. Yeah, Paul. But going back to worship, the temple, the temple as a church. Yeah. Okay, we, we soak up the Holy Spirit, uh -huh. but then... We are also here to worship and pray because we have a job too. Well, yes, because of what the, because the Holy Spirit has filled us to do that job. Absolutely, we're not just here to sit, biding our time until the good Lord takes us home. Oh, I thought you were going to the end of the he service. Heaven's <laughs> oh, to the end of the service. Yeah. No, heaven is coming to earth through the fiery presence of God. 
to fill his people so that they bring the river of life out to the ends of the But even in church. And even in church. I mean, yeah, I mean, we're proclaiming up and praying. We're proclaiming the gospel and God's goodness together. Yes. I like that whole picture. Uh, Pastor Butler's going to talk about how we forget things otherwise. <laughs> and, and all you have to do is read the Bible to see the way people forget. And like in very selfish and sinful ways, too. Not just, oh, I forgot to put the garbage out this morning. But, um, forgetting who our creator is and what he gives to us. And that's the other purpose of gathering together as the people of God to be reminded by the Spirit's work. Okay, other comments or thoughts about, about this? Ben. It's nice to think, you know, think of a building just being in one place, but with Jesus yeah. as a cornerstone, think about every church around the world yeah. that has Jesus as its foundation and how all of creation now is his temple. Thank you. And his love. Thank you. Okay, so let's bring this into the worship service now, Ben's point that he's making. Um, we're, we've, we've heard the word of God through the readings, the sermon, uh, and then we've said the prayer of the church. We've gone to God in prayer. And now we're going to come into the presence of God's throne room, or maybe a better way to say it is God's going to bring his presence down among us in the supper and we sing right before uh, right before we sing um, what's called the Sanctus Holy 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 the pastor usually ends the, the section right the preface before it therefore with all the saints on earth right your church isn't just in one place it's not just here it's all over the place your people are gathered all over with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven we join their glorious song and praise your holy name. It's a great point. God's holy. And they even say it. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with your glory. Good. Any other thoughts or comments on the temple of God uh, being people in whom he dwells by his spirit? Good. Okay, so where is all of this heading and, and um, heaven and earth and what is this all? Let's go to Isaiah 65. <coughs> I think it's important to read read some of these things from the, the Hebrew Bible, the Old, Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, but... just to see that some of the stuff that we read in the New Testament isn't the first time we hear about God creating a new heavens and a new earth, but that actually he talks about this through the prophet Isaiah. So this is a longer section from Isaiah 65, but if somebody would, should we split it up? Somebody could read 17 to 20. And then someone else take 21 to 25. Let's split it up. Nancy, you've got 17 to 20. Who wants the last part? Gene, it's all yours. See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I, I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people of joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. Never again will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his years. The one who dies at a hundred will be thought of as a mere child. The one who fails to reach a hundred will be considered accursed. They will build houses. Oh, let's let Jean go yeah, now. That's what I wasn't you, were, sure. you were on a roll. You were on a roll, Nancy. That's great. Well, I wasn't let, sure where I was let's, supposed let's, to stop, so I hesitated. Perfect. Jean, take it from here. 
They will build houses and dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. No longer will they build houses and live, and others live in them, or plant and others eat. For as the days of a tree, so will be the days of my people. My chosen ones will long enjoy the works of their hands. They will not toil in vain, or bear children doomed to misfortune. For they will be a people blessed by the Lord, they and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb will feed together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox, but dust will be the serpent's food. They will neither harm nor destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. Okay. What does it sound like is happening here, or, or is God's promise? He's going to restore us to what we made in the first place, the perfect world. We will have a perfect world, and we will get along with everybody. Okay. There's sin out of the world, there's sorrow and all that stuff that sin brought. Okay. A restoration to what... Uh, God originally designed and created. Uh, good. Which this section is saying that the present heavens, skies above, God's space, the present heavens and the present dry ground, it all needs to be purged. Like it just it needs to be purged of sin and death and decay and destruction. The whole thing. All of it. That's why in the reading from Joel, like when Peter quotes Joel today, he, he's going to talk about there will be signs in the heavens above and on the earth below. Blood and fire and billows. It all has to be purged. Now, of course, all of this has already taken place. All of the death and sin and condemnation has already been purged where? on the holy mountain where, where Christ basically absorbed everything all of it was purged in his flesh and done away with um, but there will be a day when Jesus appears and the present heavens and the earth will be will pass away but God says it sounds, it sounds like he's saying it's, he's going to make a new one uh, a new heavens and a new earth. Does that sound about right here? I mean, is that what you're gathering from this? New heavens, never heard of that. What's that? A new, new heavens? heavens? Never heard of that. Yeah, yeah, I think we usually think of, of heaven as, as being this place that stays the same. Well, yeah, Always. because when people die, you want to go to heaven because it's perfect. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, it's not. Not presently. If, and if we're thinking of, so God's presence, if we're thinking of heaven as just the presence of God, that's all, that's, that doesn't change, right? That God's dwelling is there. That's, that's not in any way unwhole or, or incomplete. Um, but when we think about heavens, the way that the, the book authors refer to them as, as these bodies and, and, and then the space that's above the dry ground, those heavens need to be, they need to be restored. Does that make sense, Paula? Yes, I like that better. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're gonna, I don't know whether we're gonna read the other sections from Romans and from uh, Revelation today. I think you guys can probably just read those on your own and enjoy them. I, I would like to spend a couple minutes just talking about what you brought up because I think that that is a, a good, a good thing. To consider when we when we talk about death and um, you know, what happens. First, though, are there, we we really didn't spend much time on this section from Isaiah. It's very powerful. There's a lot we could talk about. But is there anything from from that section yet that you wanted to discuss or had questions about? Okay. So uh, based on. On, on everything we've, we've gone through, let's just spend a little time discussing ways to, to 
speak about death, and we'll do that bottom one, and the, and the Christian hope, ways to speak about those that are consistent with Scripture. Go ahead, Nancy, get us rolling. When God, when Jesus comes again, the dead will, the dead in Christ will rise, and those of us that are left will be gathered up into heaven. But we will all be judged, the good and bad. And when Jesus said that we were good, we'll say, well, no, we weren't. And, and God will say, well, he didn't see our sins because of the righteousness of Christ. He didn't judge. Okay, all right, so good. Let's just back up to the first thing that she said uh, about death. If, if we speak about death as though, um, you know, it's kind of like the, the, the end and, and people go to be with Jesus, those are very consistent ways to speak about Scripture. But, but we leave out a bodily resurrection and restoration. Um, I don't know if we're... If we're completely being consistent with the scriptures or the creeds. The Nicene Creed ends with we believe in the resurrection of the body and the life of the world to come. So we say it in the creeds too. Even the Apostles' Creed. Um, how does that end? And all of these come under the, the third article, the work of the Spirit we would say. Um, in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. So, that was very, again, like if you think about this, this was very controversial when <coughs> Paul was doing ministry in the Greco Roman world to, to Greek philosophers. Having a, a physical body was an unattractive thing. They thought that the body was like the prison of the soul. And if the soul can just attain wisdom and escape the fleshly, bodily realm, that's what we're after. Um, but Paul started preaching this bodily resurrection of Jesus, first of all, and that, that Jesus is going to bodily raise his people. And they're kind of like, Ugh, I don't know, that, sounds, that doesn't sound that great. Why would we want these bodies back? Well, they're going to be transformed and they're going to be glorious and new. That's what a lot of 1 Corinthians 15 is about. Okay? How about just death in general? Speaking of death in a way that's consistent with the scriptures, is it natural? No. Is it? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's presented as a, a, an intruder into God's good world. And it's also connected to the rebellion of the man and the woman. So death is... Uh, we, I think there's a lot of interesting ways in our culture that we try to skirt around the nastiness of death. They're in a better place. They passed away. They're dead. And that sucks. Death is awful. It's awful. And it was not part of God's creation for his good world. Okay? It's not definitely where we want to end it, but other ways to speak about death. Let's talk about what Paula brought up. Um... So we're speaking about what happens to a, a follower of Jesus when they die. It's a couple verses, really, that talk about that, but not a, the, the Bible doesn't spend a lot of time talking about what happens to believers when they die. It's a little bit more focused on this reuniting of, of a new heavens and a new earth and God's presence among humans. Like that's what we're trying, God's getting us back to. That's the main story of the Bible. And so when we talk about what happens to people when they die, uh, the, the scriptures that come to mind, at least for me, and for you maybe, what are some, some sections you think of when you go? Joe? Joe? 
Okay, so you're talking about when Job says, in my flesh I will see God? That, that part? Okay, so that's something Jesus says later, right? I mean, that's not... Job doesn't say that about himself. No. Okay, I'm just making sure. <laughs> yeah, Job believes in a bo- Job does believe in a bodily resurrection. Sure. Yes. Um, I think of where they say where Jesus says, um, "You will have a woman my house." Okay. Okay. So you have Jesus talking about, "I'm, I'm going to prepare a place for you." Okay. Good. Uh, Paula. Think that. Yeah. Think on the cross. Today you will be with me in paradise. Good. So I think that's one of the, the places that we think of when we're, we're trying to understand maybe what happens to someone when they die in the Lord or fall asleep in the Lord, that they, they go to be with Jesus. Um, Doesn't our soul go to heaven and our body stays here on earth? <clears throat> That's, yeah, I mean, that's what we say, like, in our dogmatic textbooks, yeah, that there's a separation of body and soul. Um, I, I think of, um, I think it's Matthew where he's created many mansions and, uh, for us if we believe in him. And I believe, well, because of that, we'll, we'll be guests in his man one of his mansions. Guests in his presence. Guests in his heavenly presence. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so Bob. In the parable of the rich man or Lazarus, doesn't Jesus say that the angels carry carry it into uh, rooms, carry rooms Lazarus? Bosom. Yeah. Bosom. Yeah, and, and so I guess the the place where people would push on that is it's a parable too. So it's like if, you know Are we gonna like? Are, are, are we gonna be able? To, are people who are uh, in the in the other realm of how are they gonna be able to see us and ask us for a drink of water? You know what I mean? Like some of that's kind of it, it is a parable Jesus is telling, but I don't know. I think the safest way to talk about death and and what happens to a believer when they fall asleep is they they go to be with the Lord, and, and that's probably just a good way. To await a bodily resurrection. Katie? Um, one thing that I've kind of changed over the years and talking to my kids about death and heaven is they used to be like, oh, yep, you're going to go to heaven, and they, from you know, culture and other things around them, they think of heaven as this like place with clouds and brightness and you know, happy place, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. which isn't kind of think, scriptural very much. You know, it's God's presence is. Perfect, but uh-huh. uh, I've kind of started saying, you know, like when we pray at night, uh, thank you for dying on the cross and taking away my sins so that I can be with you forever. Yeah. So that kind of takes up the <coughs> Yeah. We have or the new, the new earth. Like, Good. We, we will still be on, and I say, yeah. we will still be on earth. There's the new earth with God. Yeah. Yep, that's where everything's headed, ultimately. It's a, it's a re, renewed, restored heaven and earth where God dwells among humans uh, forever. And yeah, yeah. I think it's it's really helpful to, to always speak in language of, we don't, not necessarily us going up to heaven, but heaven coming to us. Because when you talk about, to your children, about Christ dying for you because he loved you, as in that moment, heaven is coming down to them. And the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is among us. So I think it's, it's probably a little more biblically accurate to talk about heaven coming to earth. Through Jesus, of course. It doesn't just magically happen like at Disney World or something. It's like it's through Jesus. So. Yeah, and being with, with him forever, we are starting now. Right now. When right we, now. When creation whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood, that's life. Okay, let's, uh, is it good, Gene? If it's good, you can go. You can shut that off, Levi. Levi.